All right, I guess we can um, uh, start with getting started then. We have some more people entering the, the waiting room, but um, just in the uh, the interest of time, I'll, uh, I'll kick things off. So um, welcome everyone to our session on um, data use in e-registries. Uh, my name is uh, Brian O'Donnell. I'm an implementation advisor at the Norwegian Institute of uh, Public Health and I'm also supporting uh, UIO on some of their implementation activities of uh, DHIS2 packages. Um, but I want to um, uh, start the session by just by introducing a bit about our team at the Norwegian Institute of Public Health on the e-registries initiative. Um, we will be going into some of our more advanced tracker use cases today about using a uh, tracker for point of care clinical data entry and also how we uh, combine this implementation style with, um, with research to actually understand how these data can be used in, uh, can be used in practice, um, both at the clinical level and also um, at a, a researcher's or supervisor's level as well. Um, and also for digital client communication. So I'm joined today by my colleagues, uh, Akuba Dolphin, who is um, also an implementation advisor at uh, NIPH. And we'll be discussing about um, some of the technical considerations for um, uh, point of care data collection and about designing with the user. Uh, we'll also hear from um, Dr. Binyam uh, Bugale. He is, a, um, he is a, just recently finished his PhD studies um, at the University of Bergen on um, digital uh, client communication and specifically the research that was done in Palestine with their MCH e-registry. Um, so he'll talk a bit about that. Um, then uh, uh, Eleni Papadopoulou will talk a bit about um, implementation and evaluation of interventions or procedures in clinical care about how we can use these e-registries data for research. Um, I'll talk a bit about um, how to build dashboards on quality of care. And um, finally, um, we'll have some summarizing words from um, the PI of these studies, Dr. Frederick Froen, who will um, be discussing a bit more about, um, about the e-registries initiative and sort of summing together some thoughts about the future directions for e-registries. Um, so uh, with that, um, Akuba, how about you, uh, you, take, you take the lead? I see you're already sharing your screen, so maybe you could present. Great. Um, hello, everybody, and thanks for joining our session. Um, so my name is Ekuba Dolfein, and I am presenting this with a colleague, Mahima. Um, you know, that's her name on my um, on my Zoom link. And uh, she she worked on this in Palestine, but she's now on my tennis team, so I'm presenting this on her behalf. So um, the e-registries initiative um, had a, a trial in. Yeah, in the West Bank in Palestine. And um, this, um, we were working with the public health system, which um, we're looking at their maternal and child health systems. And they have public primary health care systems um, all over. And we were looking at their clinical guidelines, their reporting routines. We looked at their management by referral. And we're focusing also on labor and delivery, where they, they also had labor and delivery services in their hospitals. But we were Kuba, could I just interrupt you briefly to yeah. say that I, I don't think you're sharing your slides. I'm not. You're okay. yeah, you're in um you're not in presentation mode. So you're still on next develop spreadsheet for configuration uh, is what you're sharing. So I think you need to share your presenter mode screen. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. No problem. Thanks for but this is what it looks like on my screen. Okay, there we go. It still does not show a uh, presentation screen. Does it show presentation screen? It, it doesn't show the presentation mode yet, okay. but it's yeah. um, yeah. but maybe you could just walk through this now. Just just okay. press down let instead. Me, no? um, okay, let me stop sharing and share me. Okay. 
Okay, is it sharing now? Hello, Brian, you're muted. Yes. yes, yeah, it's sharing. Okay, as presentation? We could, we see your presenter notes. This has animation, so this needs to be done. Right. right. So you could also just uh, share the the PowerPoint slides and press and press down for that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Is this working now? Yep. Great. Perfect. Sorry, everyone. So, um, as I was talking about, we were working in the West Bank of Palestine and we developed the maternal and child health digital registry that we call the e registry. So, um, our trial was called EREPAL. It was a cluster randomized control trial where our objective was to look at the effectiveness of the e registry's clinical decision support compared to paper based records on the quality of um, antenatal care. And we were looking at it through two lenses. We looked at um, the effectiveness of this e registry on processes of care and also on health outcomes. So process of care includes things like screening, we're looking at how the health workers actually behave, and the health outcome is what happens at the end of the antenatal care. Um, if you do proper screening, are we going to get better results in terms of um, children not being born prematurely, et cetera? So um, we recruited over this period, and we looked at um, 133 clinics, and we eventually, through this process, analyzed um, over 7,000 ANC visits um, in each arm. So we had an arm that had the e-registry and an arm that just continued with paper. So we were looking at these features that we were providing to, um, to the e-registry section. So in, um, for data entry processes, the e-registry had longitudinal health records unlike the paper that they had um, in the control, you have a searchable database. For those of you who are um, familiar with DHIS to tracker, um, you also have the opportunity of identifying data errors during data entry. We put in program rules to take care of that. And we also made it possible for the, um, the system to automatically schedule client appointments based on what your gestational age was. And on the clinical side, we gave clinical guidance for care, what we call clinical decision support. And we also gave management to the health worker based on the national guidelines. And we would highlight um, clients who are at risk. And we also gave directions on when to refer. So this is actually what we were looking at. These are the paper records that came out of um, Palestine. They had these um, several paper records that were kept in huge um, um, registers all over in their um, in their offices, but of course you cannot be carrying these up and down. And they definitely are not interactive. And we compared that with this interactive clinical decision support of the e-registry. So some features that you see here are um, something like unmanaged condition. So then it will tell you that there is something that is, um, that is a concern with this uh, client that you need to, to manage and you will give you management to take care of that. Um, it tells you that this is a high risk pregnancy. It tells you what the expected um, delivery date is, gestational age, and then it highlights certain risks for you. And um, it tells you that on, um, on the 20th of October, this um, client was diagnosed with, was mentioned, or it was diagnosed with chronic hypertension and their gestational age was nine. And then we would tell you what to do um, based on that. So how would you develop such a program that has all these features of clinical decision support, et cetera? What you would do is that you would, first of all, plot out the data entry workflow for, um, for, 
for the system, what you have to do is you have to view data from all the sources, like their notebooks and the registers of all the um, health workers. You have to take notes of how they register new clients, how did they find existing clients and add to their record. But remember, you're trying to create a searchable database, so you want to mimic what they've already done. And so if you understand their workflow of how they register and how they find existing clients, you can then put that in your search features for the database that you develop. Um, where do they record data and in what sequence? What fields do they discard in their registers? Because now that you're developing a new system, you have the opportunity to discard data points that are not used. And we know that we see that a lot in our health systems. So when you then collect all the data points, um, some of the examples that you'll be seeing will be coming from Bangladesh. I was working uh, on the Bangladesh system. And so some of it, but the process was the same. So some of these examples you'll be seeing will come from Bangladesh. Um, so in this situation, there were four different um, data sources that I looked at in Bangladesh. And you try to find which, for each um, source, um, this was, for example, um, an injectable family planning card, a couple register, a maternal and newborn card, delivery um, um, form, et cetera. What are all the different um, data points that are recorded and try to find synergies between if you're trying to just get uh, consistent data points that people will use in your new electronic system. And then you should try and plot out the clinical workflow. For, so for example, if you're looking at um, blood tests for, um, for checking anemia, um, what different type of tests are you looking at? Uh, are you using the hemoglobin test, the hemocrit, or clinical science? And for each one, what, is, what are the values that you use to diagnose no anemia, moderate, or severe anemia? And what are the actions that you will take? So with this, of course, you have to work with a clinical expert, and this is what we did. We plotted these things out, and then we would um, present it to the clinical experts in the country and make sure that this is in line with their guidelines, and also as much as possible in line with WHO guidelines. And then um, the next step that people who, are who do configuration will be familiar with is to develop a spreadsheet for configuring in DHIS2. So for each data point, um, you have where the data point is supposed to be. Um, do you have an I button? What is the data entry formula? Do you have a validation? For example, the national ID in this context had to be 13 or 17 digits. So you write a program rule to check that. Um, do you have show high rules? Um, so in this situation, if the type of outcome was that the child was still alive or still birth, et cetera, then you would, you know, you would um, show this, um, this data point is, do you need to do a referral? Is it an urgent referral or is it a non-urgent referral? Um, all of this is written out. So it goes from that flow with the clinical worker, um, with the clinical expert to a spreadsheet like this. And it makes it very easy to be very clear what the rules are, because as we know, when we're doing configurations, you have to be very exact. And this also makes it very easy to test the system. This, these are your requirements for the system. And um, this, is, this is a way that we have found works both for the DHIS2 expert as well as for the person, um, the clinical expert or the person who will be testing the system. So these are the results that we got from Palestine. Um, when we look at the process outcomes, screening and management, we realize that if you look at diabetes and anemia, we did have some difference between the e-registry clinics and the control clinics. Um, the e-registry clinics had um, a higher percentage of screening because we guide the health worker during the data entry to screen for these um, for diabetes and for anemia. However, um, the difference may not have been significant. And so we also looked at the health outcomes, which is, um, which is pregnancy. And we found these, um, the, the, uh, the health outcomes within the pregnancy, we looked at moderate severe anemia, large for gestational age baby, severe hypertension, for small for gestational age baby that was undetected during ANC, and malpresentation at labor that was not detected during, um, pregnant, during ANC. For example, if the child was breached, you should have detected it and then referred for um, for care at a higher level. So um, we see that there was not a significant difference in the health outcomes, unlike what we saw with the, um, for the process outcomes of the screening. 
um, the 29.9% in the um, non-registered clinics versus 21.7% in the e-registered clinics. Um, but one thing that we did see when we look at a secondary outcome of attendance was that um, we consistently had, um, we had these, these were the attendance values that we've got at the key um, ANC periods um, that you know, people are supposed to um, come to. And then when we actually look across at all ANC visits, we see that actually when you combine these, because these look like it's kind of reasonable about you know, half the time people show up. But when you actually look at all ANC visits from 16 to 36 weeks, only 9% of people showed up for, um, for these visits at the non e registry clinics, at the control clinics, and 8% at the e registry clinics. And so this we feel kind of tries to explain the differences that we saw. So our interpretation of these results was that clinical care decision support in ANC is effective. We were able to implement um, this system in all the primary health care clinics in Palestine. And we think that the quality of care can be improved. Um, there are additional digital health interventions like quality improvement dashboards, which Brian will be talking about in a bit. And we also saw that we also think that increased coverage of antenatal care attendance may improve the health outcomes because we did see some difference in the screenings, but in the health outcomes, there was not enough because you have only 8% versus 9% attendance. Um, you are not going to get the results that you need. So this then leads on to um, my other colleague, Dania, who is going to talk about what we then did to address attendance using tar targeted client communication by SMS. Let me stop sharing and Dania can continue. Thanks a lot, Akuba, for that uh, discussion of the results of this, uh, the Palestine trials or the early results. Um, Benim is not going to be sharing a bit more about um, SMS use in the Palestine e-registries. Um, I'd like to request that people, if they have questions during these sessions, to please leave them in the, in the chat. Um, and we will also have some time at the end for some, um, uh, for some open discussion uh, form. Um, but maybe we can hold all of the questions until the end. Oh, sorry. Um, we're just trying to keep a record of all of the chat and conversation. So I've, I've posted a link to the community of practice. Okay. If you can uh, jump it in there, that'd be great. Great. Yeah. Sorry about the chat. I mean, the community of practice. Thanks, Grant. Yeah. No worries. Um, Binyam, I uh, can take it from here. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think you can see my screen, right? Yeah. Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I will be presenting from the uh, perspective of how this rich data in the registry system can be uh, actually used to support clients uh, with individualized messages, uh, because these type of messages are um, known to be effective than more generic and untargeted messages in uh, health communication. Um, so in our project, we approached uh, by just using this rich data to tailor message individual communication to pregnant women. Um, Akuba already showed you the, the uh, gap uh, in attendance and especially in the timeliness of attendance. Uh, another research we conducted, uh, cross-sectional research, showed that uh, the same finding that if you take like crude measure, measurements like ANC4 plus that is uh, used uh, commonly by many uh, researchers as an indicator to ANC adequacy, uh, which is about 60%. Uh, and in Palestine, they recommend uh, five focused visits and that's about 48%. But when we account for the timeliness of visit, according to the national guideline, it's only 6%. And if you adjust that with the time when uh, the pregnant woman actually um, joined the health service, that would be 13%, but still it is much lower. So what's the evidence actually is uh, this kind of communication work in uh, improving the attendance, especially regarding timeliness. 
systematic reviews actually show that there is a mixed effectiveness uh, in improving attendance and adherence to treatments and some behavioral change communication, but the ones which are very effective are often based on um, some behavioral change theories and designed with the users. That's a co-design or user-centered design concept and um, tailored to individual needs as much as possible. Um, so I will be just focusing on these three concepts and now uh, we try to incorporate this in our uh, development process. Um, uh, but I'm not saying that these are the only uh, parameters which make the SMS or targeted client com communication um, effective, but these are the prominent ones, so I will be focusing on them. Um, so we used a theory, behavioral change theory. Uh, we picked health belief model uh, because it suits to uh, the problem statement we have and um, the way we want to approach this problem. Uh, we used um, this uh, health belief model uh, to explore the perception of pregnant women and the perception of healthcare providers in terms of how uh, pregnant women see the need and uh, use of health services uh, on timely manner for all the ANC visits. So our focus is only on the um, women who have no risk factors uh, or risk conditions that they are treated in the basic group according to the WHO recommendation. Um, based on that assessment, we came up with the health belief model constructs, which are very uh, important in that context. And the three important health belief model constructs were susceptibility, severity, and perceived benefits. So that is the target of our message uh, in the SMS. And we used um, uh, concepts from uh, behavioral economics like nudging and enhanced active choice. Uh, to frame the message so that it is appealing and acceptable to the uh, end uh, users or the receivers of this message. So this figure is just to reflect how we tried to incorporate all the um, theories and frameworks in just writing a text message. Um, so this is to deal with the, the, the content of the message, whether the content actually is acceptable, usable, uh, by the end users and at the same time not leading them into an adverse outcome or adverse effect because of the communication we have at the personal or individual level. So we also used uh, the concepts from um, the feedback model of actionable feedback that the message would be communicated on timely manner, individualized, customizable, and non-punitive. So this is reflected in this um, example message which is actually sent for a pregnant woman uh, in week between 18 to 22 without any diagnosed hypertensive condition so this is targeting to uh, help pregnant women actually um, perceive their susceptibility to high blood pressure during pregnancy and what to do for them Um, so the advantage of the e-registry, having this rich data uh, is um, very important in tailoring to individuals uh, because in prior research, it is not possible. Uh, the, the research were more pilot projects and uh, created on demand manner uh, than having a long term um, large information about individuals. Um, so the e-registry now solves this problem for us because there is a long list of variables uh, and um, uh, dynamic uh, variables or information about the pregnant women is also there. So that can be used uh, to tailor the message. Um, after having this information, um, we uh, created the library of message for um, different conditions and risk factors, uh, which we are selecting to target and then store that in the library. And there are informations will be inserted automatically through the program uh, rules we uh, wrote. And so 
for example, for this uh, typical message, we have a, a condition where pregnant women in the gestation are late week for 24 to 28 receive this message. Uh, if the age is greater than 35 and have uh, hypertension, previous uh, gestational diabetes, mellitus, and high body mass index as a risk factor. And then we wrote the program rule to trigger the message and the schedule for to be sent um, one week before the, the appointment. But we have all uh, other types of message actually. Um, types of message will be sent uh, immediately at the booking or the first visit. That's a welcoming message. And then uh, type of message I've just discussed above seven days before uh, with um, appropriate gestational age window and having not being diagnosed with the condition, in this case, um, high blood pressure or hypertension. And then the three days before that is adding a risk factor for the high risk condition, which is targeted during this uh, gestational age window visit. Uh, and 24 hours before message, that's just a simple reminder for all um, visits scheduled. And then the other type of message which are sent after the schedule, the schedule uh, has been passed are uh, missed appointment reminders. If someone missed appointment yesterday, for example, and then today that person will receive a message that saying, you already missed that, miss, uh, that appointment, so you need to reschedule another appointment or contact the clinic. And then if that is not happening, then another type of message where we try to encourage people to get reconnected to the health system uh, afterwards. Um, so in this whole process, we have like strict um, engagement with the users uh, at all eight uh, stages. Um, from the beginning, we approached the national uh, experts uh, in the panel form to identify and prioritize the target conditions. And then the understanding of the user perception, which I discussed about, we, we use qualitative research method. And um, in the evaluating and refining the message also, we involve the stakeholders. And finally, the training of the healthcare provider is also very important because they have to accept and um, be um, have uh, show ownership of these messages because um, at the end the clients will be communicating back to them and the, um, so that we already provided the library of message and they have been involved in the development of this message they are ready to respond to any questions and we also train them about the practicality how to sign up women to this. Uh, SMS service when um, they encounter the woman for the first time. Um, this is a preliminary result from our forearm uh, trial. Uh, this is just to show you how uh, this targeted client communication uh, affected timeliness of uh, intervention uh, acceptance. Um, so these are the timely vis visits according to the national guideline. And um, for the control group, without any uh, individualized communication, um, the proportion uh, is approximately the same with the, what Akuba showed. But this one improved, like having the targeted client communication, at least in the proportion wise, it is uh, better. Uh, on average, it is uh, 43% and uh, groups who received the TC communication and 35% in the control. Uh, but we haven't analyzed controlling the, all the dynamics we are supposed to do. Um, so some of the limitations we faced throughout this design and development process is um, if once the scheduled message is there and then there is a need to update that scheduled date, for example, it's not possible because it's just once scheduled, can only be controlled when uh, it is sent out like from the gateway, but it's not possible to improve that through any program rules. Um, we need also further exploration to receive text message back. Two-way communication is supposed to be 
gold standard in uh, this type of communication. And finally, um, as I've shown you, like there is no functionality that's supporting um, sending or scheduling a message based on the first appointment dates. Uh, if a person misses the appointment, it's not possible to uh, use the DHS and build system to send a message. So we had to work around using uh, our uh, to, to overcome this problem. So if that is incorporated in the future, I think this is uh, a good way of using existing data without any additional data collection need. Um, and that can also maximize the investment um, on e-registry type of approach. Yeah, thank you. Great, thank you so much, Binyam, for the... Um explanation of the different SMS uh, interventions that were done in Palestine and a bit about some of the challenges that we've had with uh, with that as well. I'm going to uh, share the uh, screen. Uh, can you stop sharing your screen? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Make sure it's in presenter mode. Um, Hmm. It's not actually showing up one second. Um, can I still share screen here? Grant. Uh, just made you the host. See if that helps. There should be a okay. Yeah, there there's... it is. Cool. Okay. And let me see here. Um. Let me see, maybe uh, you can see the screen now, but I don't think that's my yep. presentation there right now. All right, um, sorry folks, I'm just going to, in the interest of time, move through uh, this pretty quickly. I hope that um, you can see my see my see enough of my slides to move through this. Um, but the discussing of um, different ways that e-registry's data can actually uh, help uh, follow guidelines um, that are already at the institute at the national level, but maybe haven't filtered down to the clinical level. Um, we're going to talk a bit now about how to actually use those data that come through the um, e-registries to improve quality improvement programs with this MCH use case in Palestine as an example. Um, so what are these uh, e-registries uh, dashboards trying to accomplish? We've already touched a bit about a bit upon this, but this is sort of the central themes of the dashboards that we will discuss. So we want both better screening and management for uh, anemia during pregnancy, hypertensive disorders, uh, diabetes, and also, as Binyam was talking about in his previous session, uh, more timely and continuous uh, attendance for antenatal care and postpartum care. Um, so there's this tight uh, interrelationship between both the guidelines and clinical report feedback and reporting uh, that one would see as well. So um, the guidelines as, as Akuba presented are built into program rules of the, uh, the tracker program. Um, and now in our dashboards, we actually want to understand uh, adherence to those guidelines as well. Um, and so this is a bit about thinking through um, not just uh, the, the numbers of individuals that have come through the system, are they going up or down over month, but also really understanding the, the quality of care over time, right? What is a individual patient's experience uh, in the MCH system in Palestine? And having this sh shared client record of the e-registry 
uh, really helps to promote uh, con continuity and quality of care. Um, in, a, in a clinical context, when we were doing this um, background research on, um, on what works for a, a quality improvement dashboard intervention, we did a pretty extensive literature review of um, in these types of contexts as in the public ANC system of Palestine, uh, what would actually work for a dashboard. So we knew that presenting the information uh, frequently, giving some information both uh, verbally and in writing were important. Um, but also, um, also thinking about um, some very specific theory-driven uh, interventions as well, uh, such as the, the, the feedback intervention theory and also the model of actionable feedback. We understood that um, you really wanted to have um, timely, individualized, non-punitive and customizable uh, feedback that is given as well. And what does that mean in, in practice? Um, well, when we were designing the, these dashboards, as you can see here at the left, I apologize for the small screen, but at the very top here, you can see um, timely. So is this a uh, real time uh, data that's, this is real time data that's being entered um, uh, on a daily basis. Um, and so the different themes would actually show up every week for a different priority theme, whether that's anemia or hypertension uh, or attendance, um, and they would get notifications or DHIS2 messages. There was a new theme and new data to explore that week. So we tried to make it, it timely and show the, the last month's data. Um, individualized, so at the, the clinical level, um, and also making sure that um, non-punitive, so there's no mandatory interaction with uh, supervisors. A clinician can open up the dashboard themselves without asking a higher up to, um, to, to have access to it or to help them understand what it, it might mean. Um, so it's also non-punitive. And this is a way in which that we can just show where a clinic's position is relative to its peers within the district. So comparing the performance of a clinic on something like the percentage of clients who are screened for anemia at their first visit, how do you, com how do you look at your clinic compared to other facilities in your district? And then also uh, customizable. So we include uh, specific details and comments with what are called action items here to better understand uh, the clinician's own performance. So um, they, we basically use uh, validation rules um, in order to generate some uh, text or like um, auto-generated interpretations for where they fall within their district for certain metrics. Um, so see here you can see what kind of information was provided. So I just mentioned anemia screening at booking and you can see that your facilities average, uh, your district's average, where you rank within the facility um, and then also the total number of facilities that are reporting these ANC metrics are all included on, as sort of to provide background information on this metric and also your denominator, the total number of booking visits that you've had. Um, we wanted to show a little bit of variance. So we included the last three months of data and then we averaged those um, over time and used that to generate the facilities, um, the facilities average, so it's a rolling average. Um, and so here you can see like two basic examples of, um, of a facility where things are going quite well, um, or they are um, where they or they are doing um, pretty okay. So they are three out of four. Um, so they're they're not quite great, but they're pretty average. And then here's an example where the facility is actually doing um, not that well. So out of eleven facilities reporting in the district, they're number two. So they can actually say that they have some work to do with remembering to do anemia screening at the first visit. Um, so um, I'd walk through this diagram with the animation, sorry, but um, here you can see the sort of process that we had for actually um, running through, uh, for actually developing these dashboards. How do we populate those figures? Um, coming up with this, um, uh, comparative figures for where your facility ranks within the district requires you to know um, both your, your, all of the other facilities in your district's um, data and also your own facilities data. And it also requires us doing these averages over the, the previous three months. And when we first started, some of these features were not available in DHIS2, so we had to make some workarounds. But essentially it works that um, you have data elements for your numerator and your denominator. So for example, your blood pressure measurement at your first visit between 15 to 17 weeks 
then you put those program indicators into a super indicator. Um, and then you um, run this, um, you run this over a, a three, um, the previous three months. And you can see here month one, month two, month three. And then you come out with um, your average over the previous three months. So what we did is we ran these um, program indicators through um, a Python script to output um, where they rank within their, uh, within their district. And then the validation rules and instructions would either set positive reinforcement for a job well done, they're on track, or suggestions for improvement if uh, they were at the lower end of the spectrum. Um, these action items uh, examples we also walked through with, um, with stakeholders in Palestine to really understand what are be some of the, uh, the barriers to improvement in certain areas or what are the things that can actually be, actually be done um, at the clinical level. So you can see here that um, this is an exact, exact replica of, of these action items, but um, it might say that um, the number of women that you referred for gestational diabetes is lower than your colleagues. To improve all women with uh, results suggestive of diabetes need to be referred for testing, right? So suggesting referrals or asking um, for, for follow-up to a different level. Um, and then do not forget to re record that referral as well. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there were a number of uh, custom features that when we were developing this trial, we had to wait for core DHIS to, to develop and also for the, um, the e-registries branch of DHIS to, to, um, to put into, um, into the, the, um, our implementation. So when we first started out, some of these were, were really good already. We already had program indicators, but in particular, we had to wait for using this count uh, D2 count functions and the enrollment type uh, program indicators, this star here. Um, that was really useful for doing longitudinal program indicators. Um, we also had to build a widget for this um, showing of the validation rule um, uh, actions they were called or like the, the instructions that come with the, the validation rule after the analysis is run. Um, so those are then all brought into a, a widget on the dashboard and shared. So we had to build that. And then also the facilities district rank via dashboard. Um, as I said, we needed to go in a, a Python script. Um, so when it comes to the, the final results of this as well, um, this is just a uh, two different views of the same types of information. We actually did um, capture as well in, in another widget um, each time that a user actually opened their quality improvement dashboard and who that user was, um, just to sort of get a sense of who, how it's being used. And we can see that um, by cluster, it seems that there's actually a like a Pareto principle uh, happening with uh, dashboard use and data use. And this is a bit of an interesting finding because you can see that um, four out of the 49 clusters accounted for 58% of all of the QID views. So that does mean that um, there are a few districts or a few facilities rather that are really keen to uh, understand their numbers. And then there are lots of, um, of districts that are, and facilities that simply didn't open them that frequently. Here's one you can see that um, most facilities only viewed the dashboards you know, five days over a six month period. So this is something that we need to go back to and really understand what would drive um, opening the dashboard and, and using the data better. Um, more results on this um, second yeah, trial that we did will be coming up um, in the coming weeks. Um, it seems like there's someone else uh, has a mic is on. Um, but I will stop sharing here and let um, Eleni take over the, the remainder of the session. Uh, Dr. Eleni, can you share your screen? Yeah. Brian, can you make me the host, host again quickly? Yeah. Brilliant. Can you see it? Um, yeah, we can see it. At least I can see it. At least we, we see your, your edited slides. Maybe you can go to presentation mode. Yeah. Good. Is it? Yep. Yep. It. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. Um, OK. Um, my talk today is um, about the qualities and the um, 
and the characteristics of the registries that make them a valuable tool for research. I will summarize what Takuba and Binyam and Brian talked about, but interpret it in the lens of uh, research and how to answer scientific questions. And I will also briefly present an example of a new study that we have engaged in Uganda. These are the 10 key DJIs that are integrated in the registries and each of them supports the collection of high quality data for research. So Akuba talked about the clinical decision support at the point of care. The registries collect individual data at the point of care. So in the case of an ANC, an antenatal care registry, that will be the medical history of the woman, obstetric history and other characteristics. And it's collecting real time and longitudinal data, meaning that the healthcare provider or the woman who is uh, the client does not need to try to remember what was happening in the previous visit and the healthcare provider has a full management and tracking of the history of his client. And also very, very important what Akuba talked about it was, uh, and Brian as well, it was the, the ability to assess the quality of care, <coughs> sorry, through the e-registry. Um, this is a unique feature because attendance, screening, and management are key indicators of the success of ANC. So these components are frequently can frequently explain the failure of ANC to prevent uh, mortality and morbidity among pregnant women and, and neonates. So and often these indicators are the aim of interventions that are trying to improve um, uh, mother and child health. Um, in terms of research, again, the issue of missing data is a very important issue and very, very frequent. By supporting the workflow and reminding all the important indicators to be assessed in every visit, we can avoid this issue of missing data, the issue of misreporting and misclassification. And this is shown in studies comparing the paper-based registry with the e-registry, something like what Akuba presented. Then Binyam. Uh, talked about the targeted client communication, the reminders of the appointments and the referrals. And um, this is um, uh, this feature can also effectively increase attendance to ANC. And this strategy aims to change the behavior of the client, the pregnant woman, and improve the timely attendance to ANC, independently of her health status or her, her socioeconomic uh, status. And this results to better data for research, because again, having missing information is an important issue here. And this reduces our ability to generalize our findings, our research findings, and reduces the quality of our evidence. So we need to use methods to collect data that are not going to result to biased estimates. For example, if we didn't, instead of an e-registry approach, we're doing a survey, our, uh, our collected data are prone to who is going to participate in the survey because the surveys are usually voluntarily. So we know that the women uh, to, that are in high risk to develop a disease during pregnancy or complication for example, women of low socioeconomic status are the ones who most probably are not going to participate in our study. So uh, we have a lot of misinformation in this sense. And also uh, using, using an e-registry though, that efficiently covers the populations, the population we're targeting, this can reduce this issue and we have uh, an estimate that is as, rep as representative as possible. In the aggregated level, this also results to a reliable estimate of the prevalence and the incidence of the disease for this population. And the issue, huge issue of the false denominator um, is also reducing. And then Brian talked about the clinical quality performance dashboards. <clears throat> and through this feature, together with the workflow support that Akuba described, we can improve the assessment of the health outcome or the health indicator of interest. And this will result to a better quality of the health outcomes and a better quality of our data. Also, the features of the registry related to the management and data of uh, the management and use of the data can, as for example, the aggreg automatic aggregation that the, um, Brian explained about, the visualization of the data, automated analysis, this can empower the health professionals on data management and they can themselves identify further uses of this data and of these resourceful registries. So if we were to summarize through the e-registry approach in research, we can increase our sample size, we can have a, a representative, representative sample and a good coverage of the population we're targeting. Uh, we can assess time trends. We believe that we have a candid response from the, the participants, good quality of data, and a, a, a large flexibility in study designs. 
On the other hand, the costs of the study is reduced, the misreporting misclassification issues are, are reduced because of the low recall selection bias and the loss to follow up. And as well as the time between the data collection and the data delivery, because it's a digital solution, is potentially reduced as well. And this is an example of a project I mentioned before. This is a, a posit project, Evidence-Based Policies and Health Systems Interventions for Antenatal Care is in collaboration with Makerere University in Uganda, HISP Uganda and the King's College London. In this project, yeah, this is the district we are aiming, the Mikono district in Uganda, some demographic characteristics. We have 30,000 births every year, 62 health facilities for antenatal care. The ANC4 coverage is 60%, and, the, and half of the women are delivering their babies in the facilities. Uh, what do we want to do there? Uh, WHO is asking whether the WHO NC model with a minimum of eight contacts can impact the quality of ANC in LMICs and what is the effect on health, values, acceptability, resources, feasibility, and equity parameters. And this is what we want to answer through this study. What does it take to move from ANC4 to ANC8? The knowledge gaps here are related to the implementation research and health outcomes. And the methodology is an ANC e-registry and, and a two armed cluster randomized control trial. The first thing related to implementation research is that we want to identify the enabling factors, supporting interventions, the environment and facilitation that can ensure the feasible and acceptable and effective transition from ANC to ANC4 to ANC8. This is also what WHO wants. And this we will do through this RCT using an ANC e-registry. We believe that this will increase the fidelity to the intervention. The intervention here is ANC8 versus the control that's the ANC4. And we can assess the timely attendance, the quality of healthcare provision, feasibility indicators, acceptability satisfaction, and performance indicators. And for the second aim, we want to know whether the, this new model with a minimum of eight contacts contacts can impact the quality of ANC and what is the effect on health. The gap in knowledge that we come to uh, assess is related to the excess preterm mortality in middle income settings. And this is not supported by correlated outcomes. There is no trials of ANC schedules head to head like ANC4 versus ANC8. There is no trials of low risk pregnancies only. There, we have no trials with monitoring the fidelity to management. And there's also a lack of trials in low income and rural settings. So the, our project is assessing these gaps in knowledge. And of course, we want to assess the maternal and neonatal health outcomes between intervention and control. And of course, the key issue of the quality of healthcare provision here. Um, to summarize, the, the goal here of our project is to see what it takes to go from ANC4 to ANC8. And through that, we want to provide evidence that will add directly to the WHO and coherent evidence summaries and guidelines to improve, of course, the uptake and quality of ANC in the Mukono district in Uganda, to provide a scalable ANC e-registry solution co-designed with users to fit national policies, guidelines, and infrastructural context, and to provide policy guidance on effective implementation of alternative ANC schedule and last to provide a DHIS2 metadata package for ANC that is embedded in the tools of the DHIS2. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, Eleni. I know that was a lot of information to, to go through in a short time. Um, I don't see any questions in the, the COP, but maybe we could um, open it up for anyone to ask uh, questions since this was a lot of information. Uh, Frederick also has some technical difficulties and won't be able to, uh, to join us for the rest of the session, unfortunately. So we can proceed straight to Q&A with the remaining minutes. I was gonna say, Brian, we've probably got to uh, call it there, I'm afraid. So any questions right. will have to go into the community of practice, I'm afraid. We've got two minutes until the next round of sessions begin. I'm on orders oh, fair. to uh, <laughs> <laughs> give everyone a few minutes, I'm afraid. Oh, that's so, fine. Uh, uh, but yeah, if we were uh, in, in a conference hall in person, I would uh, ask everyone to give, give the guys a round of applause. They really sped through that today. So thank you very yeah. much, everyone. Um, we've got more sessions coming up. Let me just share. 
what we've got going on. So uh, next up uh, in the next round, we've got stuff on uh, security, uh, data quality, and uh, looking at DHS2 Design Lab uh, and DHS2 Research as well. Uh, and then later on uh, this afternoon, this evening, or this morning, depending on where you are in the world, uh, we've also got the Use Case Bazaar as well. So please do check that out. Um, thanks very much again to, to all the presenters today. Um, that's the only thing that we've got in this room. So I'm going to close this room out uh, and I'll let you go and join the next sessions. Thanks very much, everyone. Bye. Thanks, thanks all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.